life. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates, a podcast where we help you learn to invest in 20 minutes or less. We break down the world of investing from beginning to dividend so that you can hopefully make some returns. My name's Bryce, and unfortunately, I'm not joined by my equity buddy, Ren. Due to timing and Ren's birthday on the weekend and he's traveling back home, unfortunately, he can't join me today. However, that's all good because... We are here for another expert investor interview series. So Ren will join me as we interview Dan Foggo, who is the CEO of Ratesetter Australia. Something we haven't spoken about on the show before is peer-to-peer lending, and this is what Ratesetter specialize in. So without further ado, let's jump straight into it. This is our interview with CEO of Ratesetter Australia, Dan Foggo. All right, well, Ren, today we are going to be talking about something that we haven't discussed on the show before, uh, peer-to-peer lending, and we are joined by CEO of Ratesetter, Daniel Foggo. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to speak. Yeah, so uh, as I said, we haven't discussed peer-to-peer lending before, um, and it's something that none of our listeners would have uh, had exposure to as well. So Ren, if you want to jump into the first question and we can get going from there. Yeah, sure. So I guess for the layman out there who've never heard of it before, what what is peer-to-peer lending? Well, quite simply, we are giving investors access to a very well-established asset class, which is consumer loans. So historically, you know, banks have dominated consumer lending. This is what I'm talking about here is, you know, not mortgage lending, but people who are getting loans to buy an automobile or refurbish their house or go on holiday, do all sorts of things like that. And, you know, it's a very well-established asset class that people have been borrowing for these purposes for for decades. And um, um, it's been very hard for people like you and me to get access to this fantastic pool of credit and they're really large markets. I mean, you know, debt markets are absolutely enormous. And, you know, with the advent of technology, businesses like Ratesetter are actually able to lend much like a bank might lend and therefore they can give investors access to loans without them having to go through a bank structure because actually a bank structure is quite leaky in terms of the returns to investors and and, and the, the the value you get as a consumer and if you distill it you know as a consumer you put money in a bank account and you get a on a term deposit you might get one or two percent if you go and borrow an un, on an unsecured basis from a bank you're probably paying you know 15 or 16 percent so you know there's 14 to 15 percent of spread there and that is essentially going to the overheads of the bank um, to cover some losses and then obviously profits for the banks but when you think about technology um, you can actually take out a lot of those costs which should allow you a to give the investor a better return and b the borrower a better rate so that's essentially what we're doing Um, in abstract terms we're giving people access to a very well established credit cost you know, actually this is probably a good way to describe it from, I guess, that the hat that you guys wear and, and as equity mates. We think of um, peer-to-peer lending as really giving investors a nice middle ground between, you know, very low interest bearing um, bank accounts, which are giving a sub-inflationary, you know, net return at the moment, and equities, which can give a high return, but they tend to be quite volatile. We think of peer-to-peer lending as having that really nice middle ground where you're getting a return more or less between the two, depending on, you know, we'll come back to the mechanics, um, but it should be much more stable. And when you're in a recession or a tough economic environment, when you see equities come off, you know, 20 or 30%, um, clearly the expectation is consumer loans, there's a lot of data out there to give you comfort that actually the um, loss rates um, you know, are, are relatively muted in terms of movement and therefore it's a stable return. So that's the other, you know, thematic yeah. um, description of it. So to give a bit of background into yourself before we dig a bit deeper into rate setter, um, you're, you were director of Barclays Capital and assistant director at Rothschild, mm-hmm. two massive institutions. Can you give us just a bit of a general background as to how you've come to be CEO of, of Rate Setter Australia? Sure. Um, in very simple terms, I, I studied economics and finance. Um, I 
had a, briefly had a job in a, in a trading floor in a bank and decided that's not where I wanted to be. I wanted to be more in sort of mergers and acquisitions. So I went to Europe and I worked at Rothschild for just under eight years um, in M&A advisory, which was fantastic experience. At that stage, though, I knew I always wanted to do something a little bit more entrepreneurial. I actually resigned from my job three times um, oh, wow. <laughs> with an expectation that I'd go and do something entrepreneurial. And, um, and every time I was sort of talked out of it, which I guess was, a, in retrospect, not a bad thing. You know, I probably got the timing right for me in terms of when I went to go and do something eventually. Um, look, post the financial crisis, I moved to Australia, and that's when I was latterly working at Barclays Capital. And it was actually at Barclays when we were lending money to businesses and our internal cost of capital was so high when we were lending to large corporates in Australia, the bank was actually losing money. And we had to recoup that money um, through other services, through selling FX, through m advisory, these sorts of things. So um, that's when I thought actually this bank model that we're so reliant on doesn't necessarily make sense at the moment. And there must be alternatives out there, particularly when there's so much brilliant technology which you can now build reasonably cheaply relative to a decade ago. So I actually recruited somebody to to work for me to look at different business models, technology-led business models, started to see a lot of business plans out of the UK, and I got to the point where I was sufficiently confident that I knew or thought that if I went to the UK, knocked on enough doors, I'd find an opportunity that I... I would be comfortable enough or confident enough that would succeed in Australia. And so that's what I did. I resigned from Barclays. I packed up the family and went to London and spent three months um, really just visiting different businesses, trying to understand different technology-led financial services business. And on that journey, it led me to meet, firstly, Funding Circle, which is a, a another marketplace lender in that it lends to um, small businesses that just listed in the, on, the, on the FTSE in the UK. It's a sort of one and a half billion pound uh, market capitalization company now. So when I met them, they were very much early stages. I sat in a computer server room with the CEO talking about their business. Um, and they were interested in, in potentially partnering in Australia. And the other um, company I met was, was Rate Setter. Um, but as soon as I met Peter Behrens, who's now on our board, I really knew that actually the rate setter model would work well in Australia. Um, particularly when I described what consumer lending markets look like here. The UK is actually quite competitive in that you can go and get a personal loan at a really low rate. There's supermarkets, there's lots of other um, companies that will lend to you in the UK. Um, But here it was very concentrated, very big spreads between deposits and borrowing rates. And I thought that the opportunity was much more clear around lending to consumers than lending to businesses. So... Um, two days later, I flew to Australia, started diligence in the market. A month later, I was back in the UK. We had agreed a partnership model, and we went about sort of setting up the business here. Wow. So you don't own rate setter at all? Or? So yes, um, the the UK rate setter business owns about fifteen percent of rate setter in Australia. Right. Um, so um, there's a reasonably broad broad shareholder base. Car sales are the listed um, yeah. automotive business owns with its subsidiary strat in about 20%. There are some financial investors supporting the business as well, but the management team um, and related parties own around about half of the company. And we thought very early on that actually, um, you know, there's some synergy with banks being <coughs> cross-border because they can move capital to the different parts of the world where it makes sense to deploy that capital. With businesses like this, it's very much about, you know, your home market, your home regulations, which are different, um, and making sure that you've got a team that can really run the business you can't do this remotely and similarly when you're a technology sort of lead business um, you need to control your own destiny so we, we very much control our own destiny in that regard yeah. Yeah. so when uh, before we get to the journey of rate setter, if we take a step back and we take you back to when you were looking at the different models for peer-to-peer lending um, maybe we can discuss some of the different ways of some of the, those, these businesses operate you might give our listeners a good insight into what the industry is doing and then if you can talk to why you thought rate setter was the right model to Mm -hmm. enable that peer-to-peer lending sure so i think um if we call it sort of peer-to-peer lending 1.0 was really um um about um the platform grading loans um in terms of the risk of the borrower 
So they played a function where if you applied for a loan, they would categorise you as sort of an A borrower or a B, C, D, E, F, G, and they would allow investors to f fund those loans based on that rating, and each rating would attract a different interest rate. So from an investor perspective, um, it's great for sophisticated investors. You could go onto one of these platforms, you could take a view on the risk versus the return, and you could allocate a portfolio accordingly. Um, ideally, you had a lot of exposure or exposure to a lots of different loans so that you had you know, real diversification, and if one loan went bad, you weren't going to suffer an overall loss. Um, I think that model makes a lot of sense for sophisticated investors who are deploying large amounts of money. Um, and I think that's played out internationally and in that businesses that have that model tend to be funded predominantly by institutional investors. When I met Ratesetter, they, we talked about that model and then they talked about what they had introduced in the UK and the merits of that model. And it was really about changing the, the model to be less institutional, institutional investor focused to more retail investor focused. And what retail investors obviously want is really clarity around the stability of returns, confidence that they're going, they're not going to be suffering any losses because a borrower doesn't repay. And they want to get confidence around what their return is, even if they're only lending 10 or $20. And you know, you can't diversify across lots of loans if you're investing a small amount of money. So Rate Setter's um, model, um, they, they invented what is now actually the predominant model in the UK which is to have a what we call a provision fund. So every borrower who takes out a loan, some of the interest rate that they're charged, or in some loans the upfront component that's capitalised to their loan, is a, 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 a fee we call a risk assurance charge, which relates to the risk of the borrower. So it's actually risk-adjusted pricing comes into this. If you're a higher risk borrower, if you're a G borrower under the other model, then you'll pay a higher rate or a higher amount into the, our provision fund. And so every borrower is paying into that fund, it builds up over time, and the objective of course is to make sure more money is put in that fund than is ever required to pay out for any losses or defaults on, on loans. What that means from an investor's perspective is, given you've got this, call it first loss piece or self-insurance piece, albeit not an insurance product, um, it um, means from an investor's perspective it's a much more um, simplified experience. What they are able to do is um, they can, when they come to invest, there's a lot of information there explaining the provision fund, how much money is in that provision fund, and at the moment we've got about $11.7 million in our provision fund. That's against expected losses of about, I think it's about $7.7 .7 million. So it's really good coverage against the expected losses. So they can have confidence when they're investing that actually there's a big you know, amount there to protect them from any late payments and defaults. It's not a guarantee, um, it's not a bank product, we're not an ADI, um, people are um, investing with some risk, but they get um, compensated for taking that risk and that the returns are higher than what they might be with a bank account. It also means from an investor's perspective, it's, it's simplified, we allow people to invest for terms. So we have um, a one month, three year and five year lending market, or th those lending markets, and if we take our three-year lending market, for example, today um, it looks a bit like a, a, a share market. You could the lowest lending order um, is at 7.8 percent at the moment. So if you can, if you logged on, if you set up an account, logged on, you would see much like a stock market, lots of offers to lend at different rates. Mm -hmm. The lowest is 7.8 percent. If you put in an offer at 7.7 percent, your funds will be the next match to a borrower's loan. And you don't mind if that borrower is an A borrower or a B borrower as long as there's enough money in that provision fund to cover you for any late payments and defaults. So what it means is that you know through the history of rates here in the UK and they've funded just under three billion pounds, every investor's got every amount of interest in principal due. Um, and similarly in Australia, every investor's got every amount of interest in principal due. And investors have got that flexibility around um, it's a simplified process. They just, you know, they can, um, they get effectively diversification across all loans. We're funded from that provision fund, even if they're only investing a small amount. Um, and um, it's a really simple process for them in, to invest. They don't have to f be or feel like sophisticated investors making decisions around which loan categories they should invest in. They're just choosing a term um, and a, an amount they want to lend and, and the rate at which. Mm. So to clarify, 
the model for our listeners, rather than the central institution, be it a bank or be it rate setter, setting the interest rate, it's almost like a reverse auction where the lowest interest rate wins and gets matched with the best borrower. That's exactly right, yeah, and a very transparent way so you can see where all the other lenders are. You can see how many loans we've approved, which are, you know, people are waiting to draw down. You can see how many loans are outstanding, what the arrears are on those loans, what our credit losses have been for every annual cohort of loans and what we expected they'd be, how much money's in the provision fund. So that's right, it's really about giving, you know, it's about giving investors control and it's about giving them transparency and making it, um, whilst not having a um, not having a government guarantee and it's not a deposit, um, it's about trying to make peer-to-peer lending um, more stable and reliable and safer than the alternative model. Yeah, yeah. So, and just another question around the mechanisms for rate setter. Um, do as an investor, if they they want to lend to particular, um, you know, reasons for borrowing, or particular borrowers. Um, do they have any control on that, or is that all centrally managed? No, they, they don't, with one exception. So um, more recently, we've set up what we call a renewable energy um, lending market and a South Australian renewable energy market. So they're the only purposes you can choose to lend for. Okay. Um, otherwise, if you're lending in our three-year lending market, the borrower could be borrowing for one of many different reasons. Yep. But I think that's really what the... the um, the model is we've got more information on the borrowers we can price that risk better because there's certain information when we're underwriting a loan we can't share with you as an investor for example a credit score is confidential information and we can't share that with yeah. you um, but we you know just to talk about the renewable energy markets we we um, have been very fortunate to have built a, a relationship with the clean energy finance corporation which is a, a, a government related entity with, which has a mandate to encourage the adoption of renewable energy um, and they cornerstoned the launch of our renewable energy market just under two years ago which has allowed us to build a business lending to people typically purchasing solar panels or homes, um, battery storage, storage systems and that's more recently sort of culminated in an arrangement in South Australia where the South Australian government is committing $100 million to subsidise battery purchases um, to go into homes to obviously improve the supply, reliability, cost of, of power in South Australia and the CEFC is committing $100 million via our platform to um, provide you know attractive funding for people buying those systems. Right. And from an investor perspective it's fantastic, they get to participate on an, you know, an open marketplace alongside the CFC and other investors, they're encouraging the, the adoption of renewable energy. And these are typically borrowers that you know that are homeowners, obviously, um, and they're they're unlike lots of other forms of finance, they're often saving money in the first month of actually taking out a loan with us because they're reducing their power bills, replacing it with a finance cost, yeah. and so from a risk perspective, you know it's a very attractive asset class to be investing in, and that's one of the reasons why actually the. You know, our five-year lending rate today is at about 9.5%, whereas in the renewable energy market, um, it's at about 6.5%. Wow. Okay. So, and you could be committing for up to seven years, which is the term of some of those renewable energy loans when the payback takes seven years for a new yeah. system. So if you're an investor, what is the minimum amount that you can invest over one, three, or five years? Um, it's $10, um, and that was a very deliberate on our part to make sure that we were creating an investment option that's available to all Australians and what we find is it, it, often people start with a relatively small amount of money, they start lending in our one month lending market, um, they get comfortable with us, they get comfortable with the transparency, the experience, the interest that they earn, they then go on a journey of lending in longer term markets and then lending higher amounts of money. So it kind of brings us to the characteristics of our investors. Um, we have a lot of relatively young investors who are investing relatively small amounts of money so today there'll be people who are transferring you know some people might be putting four hundred thousand dollars on our platform today a lot might be putting ten dollars on our platform they might have automated payments every every month and it often reflects the different stages people are at in their life um, our average investor is about 39 years of age but that hides a huge skewing 
to millennial type investors investing relatively small amounts. They might be investing in shorter term markets, saving for a house deposit, that sort of thing. Or um, often people who are a little bit more later in life or investing via an SMSF who have a bias towards our five year lending market where the rate is somewhat higher. And they see that as more of a sort of, you know, just a running yield um, yeah. position. So before we get into too much of the details, because we've got, we're interested in, you know, how the rates are set, the, how you manage the risk and all of that, I guess it might be good to just go take us on the journey from where we left off. So you had made the deal with the UK rate setter, mm-hmm. you were going to set up in Australia. What's the journey been like from there? How's the Australian market taken it? Uh, is it, you know, is one side of the marketplace uh, more willing to jump in than the other side? You know, how, how's it been? Look, I have to say it was a very tough two years setting up the business and that was primarily around um, getting the licenses to allow retail investors to participate. To set up our business and just have sophisticated investors participating would actually be quite straightforward. Um, but we went to, we needed an AFS license, Australian Financial Services license and a credit license. So I, well, we basically spent two years with ASIC going through that process, getting them comfortable with our business model. And this was very early days in the world of fintech. Conversations started in the back end of 2012. The term fintech wasn't really used in Australia at that stage. You know, we, we literally had to explain the difference between marketplace or peer-to-peer lending and equity crowdfunding and these different models, which were quite common terms in the UK and the US at this stage, but Australia was some way behind. And that was challenging, you know, it cost a lot in, in legal advice and there was no certainty as to the eventual outcome. But eventually we, we got, we, we managed to fit a square peg into a round hole, if you like, and ASIC was very pragmatic in the end, gave us the licenses that we required and we needed relief from the law in certain instances, which we were able to obtain. And this involved, you know, conversation with the commissioners from ASIC as well, um, for example. But we had very good advisors um, around us um, and we were able to lean on that knowledge, understanding and expertise from the UK to support us and provide some credibility at that stage. So I used to have a lot of hair and look a lot younger. So they, were, they, were, they were two difficult years. And then since then, we, you know, that was four years ago that we, we launched in the back end of 2014. It's really been about putting the building blocks in place to be a much larger business. We've got real confidence around the destiny of our business. You know, we think we should represent a very significant proportion of consumer lending in Australia. Marketplace lending businesses, for example, already represent about 15% of SME lending in the UK. So you can see the journey we're going on here. We're admittedly a few years behind, but there's, you know, we believe we can catch up to where other markets are in terms of market share. So what does that look like? It's about making sure you've got the right product. So we took the technology back to the minimum sort of product and we've rebuilt it from there. We've made sure we've got the customer service functions really working well, and you'll see on product review, for example, I think we're still the most, or we are the most highly rated consumer finance business. Our average rating is just under 4.9 out of 5, in contrast to traditional institutions, banking institutions, often around, you know, one, one and a half. So, you know, I think that's a really important component of our business model attached to offering good value. And also making sure we get the credit right. At the end of the day, we are a finance business. We are in some ways a a fund management business, giving people access to consumer credit. And our core responsibility is to make sure people get the returns that they expect, or that's the way we see it. And so um, we have had to build our own credit data and so lend on a relatively conservative basis. So we didn't, you know, get out of the gates and start lending lots of money. It was about just gradually opening up who we were lending to and um, you know if you look at if I could show you a growth curve of how much we lend every month it's unbelievably consistent from the first month we launched through to now and it's gone from pretty consistent growth from obviously zero to you know just under or about 25 million um, dollars a month and that has just been about making sure we understand exactly what the losses look like for each cohort and um, we've got real confidence now around the data we've got. And actually, we're in a fantastic position because, you know, the credit data that, that different lenders are providing to credit bureaus has just increased through the introduction of comprehensive credit reporting. We're going to have open banking next year. We've got a lot of data that we can, you know, that Ratesetter can share with us from the UK. So we're in a really good position to price 
risk really well and I think we've got a real competitive advantage there in, in terms of our understanding of credit risk. Um, and we have, I believe, the most granular credit risk pricing in Australia for consumer finance. And so these are things that are becoming increasingly important. So that's just another really core cool building block that we've got in place. And then obviously the other component is people. We've, we've built a, a fantastic team here. We've now got just under 100 staff. You know, we're a finance business leveraging technology. Um, unfortunately, it does mean you, you can't just have one person sitting in a room with lots of technology doing things. We need really good people. And the way we access our customers actually requires, you know, expertise in different areas, be it renewable energy. So we have a renewable energy team that deals with installers and makes sure that they understand our product and can facilitate their customers getting finance. We have an automotive team that you know deals with um, automotive um, brokerage businesses and other channels to actually attract people who want an automotive loan and can speak with them if they, you know, ab- about the loan application. You know, it's the same across most of our different borrower channels. You need people who really understand the niche that you're in, and, and then we need a credit team who really understands the credit risk for every um, different area you're in. So. It's very much, I think, our business is distinguished by the people that we've attracted to work here. It's been about putting in foundations to grow into a large and important um, component of our financial system. And just to put a bit of flavor on that, I mean, it's actually when I set up, uh, or actually was about to resign from Barclays, I read in The Economist saying, um, you know, a, a, an article talking about if you redesign finance, you wouldn't start with a bank. You would have banks, but you would have a lot more direct lending models. And I think that's absolutely true. And I think that's where we're going. There's going to be more direct lending, be that, you know, peers lending to peers, be that superannuation funds lending to, you know, funder building for 50 years rather than the three year bank line that gets refinanced every three years. And then you find there's a credit crisis and can't be refinanced. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a significant transition that's underway. It's relatively moderate in terms of the speed, but it has to be because this is this is finance. It's not like other areas of disruption, like you know transport, where you jump in an Uber, it's a five minute ride, you get to the other end. It was a great experience. It was a clean car. You had better visibility, a nicer driver, and a bottle of water. And you go bang, that was cheaper. And you go, I'll use that from now on. Um, In finance with us, for example, you need to lend for five years to say actually lending in our five-year market is a great experience and I got all my money back. So um, it's a slightly slower pace, but it's still reasonably quick um, in that you know our lending this month is about twice what it was this month last year um, or in in November last year. In November next year, it will be about 100% again. It's just relative to the size of financial services, we're coming off a a small base. So with rates, he says on your website, rather than setting the rates ourselves, we let everyday Australian people and businesses determine the rates in our four transparent lending markets according to supply and demand of money. So if I have $2,000, just for our listeners, am I, would you just log into the website and say I want 10%? You can. Um, (laughs) Now, if you put that in our one-month market, um, after four days, we'll say, hey, your money's not getting matched. You might want to put it at a lower rate. If you put it in our five-year lending market, you might actually get matched at 10% um, if we've got sufficient demand coming through from borrowers. So if we had a lot of borrowers getting approved and drawing their loans in one day, that might, if you describe it this way, eat up a lot of the lending orders and the rates effectively move up. And we might eat through orders sufficiently so that the rates go to 10%. We ordinarily don't find that much variance. So, you know, if I was um, um, looked at logged on and I saw that our market rate or the last match rate was nine and a half percent, I'd probably lend at nine and a half, nine point six, nine point seven percent. So, what we try to do is provide enough information so people have a pretty good sense around whether their funds are getting matched. And no one's motivated for your funds to be sitting on a marketplace, not not earning interest. So. Um, we keep people updated and encourage them to move their their lending order if it's not getting funded. Yeah. So inversely, the borrowers come on and probably want to drive the rate down as low as possible. <laughs> well, <laughs> from a borrower's perspective, it's interesting. They don't really set their own rates. They go through a borrowing journey much like they might with ANZ, for example. They get quoted rates um, based on where the current market rates. They then go through a process to draw their loan and they're shown a loan contract with the current market rate in it, and we lock in the lender funds at that stage, and if they approve their 
their their loan contract and bang they're funded at that rate so you know they they set their rate in terms of the demand and that what we do find is if rates do go up in an afternoon because of a lot of demand then actually some borrowers will know that and they will hold off drawing their loan until the next day when rates come down so there is a reasonably dynamic effect there in terms of that supply and demand interesting and so as rates that are do you uh, like enforce a spread between the what the borrower is paying and what the investor is getting or is it all passed through to the investor so our revenue model is essentially we charge borrowers an upfront fee for their loan and that's capitalized to their loan so they repay that amount over the lifetime of their loan um, that's our, the main component of our revenue we also charge our investors what we call a um, lender interest margin so that is essentially 10% of their interest but the way that works is if you're lending at 9% that's the net number to you we gross up the rate for the borrower so if you're lending it in round round numbers if you're lending at 9% the borrower is paying a base rate of 9.9% yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so something that you said earlier yes uh, uh, I picked up on and I want to go back to. So you said um, that you think you have the most granular credit risk analysis in Australia. Can you explain how that comes about? Because I imagine you know banks have access to the same, if not more, data. So what, where's your edge in that? Sure. Look, I think you're absolutely right. Banks have an enviable amount of data, um, but they typically have you know relatively fixed pricing. And here's a loan rate, and you either qualify or you don't. Um, we, we have a different process, you still, if you qualify for a loan, you will fall into a different pricing bucket, one of 16 different pricing buckets. So um, how that process works is if you apply for a loan with us, electronically we'll determine whether we lend to a customer in the first instance, we put the customer through what we call a rate estimate. It's 60 seconds, we look up their credit score, we get some very basic information from them and we give them an indicative rate. At that stage, if you don't meet the basics of our credit criteria, which might be you know, being employed, um, being above a certain age, um, uh, not having a default on your credit file, for example, um, you'll, you'll, be, you'll, you'll be declined if in certain instances. And that's great because from a consumer perspective or a borrower perspective, we're not wasting your time doing a full loan application and hitting your credit score. We're only yeah. doing a soft look up at that stage if we're not actually going to lend to you. Um, so, you know, if you get a positive rate estimate, you'll get an indicative rate. You can make a decision at that stage as to whether you progress with your application. You then provide us with additional information. And, you know, a lot of that is around verification, verification of income, um, verification of some of your expenses. There's a lot of regulation around this in Australia um, in relation to the credit code, making sure that we can verify other outstanding debts. We will look at other aspects of behaviour from bank statements, whether they um, are in arrears or not any forms of finance, whether they you know, have a gambling problem, all these sorts of yeah. things are relevant and, and they all end up influencing the pricing that we can give the customer. But ordinarily the, the pricing is more or less set at that very first stage of the loan application where one's doing a rate estimate. Yeah. You know, you don't really want your rates to move significantly. But what it allows us to do is give people the best rate that they should be able to um, obtain for themselves. So what we find is, you know, our rates are typically substantially lower than what um, one can borrow from an alternative lender. And I think that's a really important point. The people we're lending to are people who have alternatives, who can go to a bank and get a loan. And that's a bit reflect, reflected probably, the easiest way to articulate that is our loss rate to date. It's only about 1.2% of the loans we've funded, whilst our provision funds 6% of our loan book. On a season basis, if um, you know it was a mature loan book, our loss rate would be, call it 2.7, 2.8% of the, the loan values that we've funded. They're pretty similar loss rates to what a bank uh, loss rates are. But actually for a bank, the new to bank customers are typically at higher loss rates than that. So you can see we're typically lending to the same sort of customer. It's just when you borrow via rate setter, you could be borrowing at a rate of 7.5% through to 15 or 16%, depending on the term of your loan, the purpose of your loan, your credit score, 
you know your other sort of you know financial situation, um, and the 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 um, it's not because we have necessarily more information than what a traditional lender might have. It's really just because we're using that. And I think the good news is we're probably as a as a as a country going further and further down that path of more and more lenders using that information to. Um, provide different pricing points for different customers. That's a very common feature in the US. It's a very common feature in the UK, um, and so that's where we're going. In the US, people typically know what their FICO score is. Mm. They'll know if their FICO score is X that they shouldn't really be paying above Y for mm. a loan. And we will inevitably move to a similar sort of situation in Australia. If I, you know, if you had a mortgage, you're repaying it every month, and someone offered you. A loan at twenty percent, you're just going to have you sort of laugh at that and say, "Well, I know that's not right. I should be. I know my credit score's eight hundred. I know I shouldn't be paying more than ten percent or something yeah, like that." Yeah. And <clears throat> the the catalyst for this is really it's competition, yeah. this positive change and this the you know the passing value to the customer only really happens when you've got a competitive market. And I think that's what we haven't really had in the past. But the great news is there's businesses like Ratesetter that are driving this competition forward. Mm-hmm. So it means that you know. We as consumers are getting better value financial services um, when we're sort of, for example, borrowing. But the other component is obviously the investor side. Um, you know, people are able to have confidence when they're investing. There's more data to allow us to underwrite loans effectively, price loans effectively. There's more businesses with that expertise around what the price of credit should be. Now, um, I got to pick up on something you said there because I reckon the most common criticism of pay-to-pay lending as an industry is. Um, why would someone borrow from you know rate setter or a, a marketplace lender if they could borrow from a bank? And so the, I th- think the most common criticism, at least when we're researching for this interview that I read, was the only people that are borrowing are credit risks who banks mm. won't touch, mm. and therefore the whole creditworthiness of the industry is in question. Mm. So yeah. here's your chance to respond. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got? <laughs> Like any any new industry, there's 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 going to be people who who don't have faith until they try it, and that's when I sort of point people back to to product review um, as an example of where they can actually get some real customer testimonies. We've got over fifteen hundred customer testimonies there. Um, the reasons are really quite simple. First and foremost, it's 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 value. One should be saving money by getting a, a loan with us versus what they might be offered by their incumbent. Provider, and then secondly, the the experience should be much faster, simpler, easier. The the interaction with our staff when we're asking questions around applying for a loan should be more friendly, you know. Um, and we can fund loans, um, you know, in 24 hours. You can get approved really quickly, so it's a really fast turnaround time. And then you know, it's fairer terms. So if someone repays their loan early with Ratesetter, there's no penalty charges. If someone wants their a statement printed. There's no additional fees for that. It's about making sure that um, there's no hidden costs. There's an, and and so what we really encourage people to do is really think about these things when they're taking, looking for finance. It's not just you know the headline rate. It's it's some of the fees and charges around that that can be quite frustrating once you're locked in. So what are some of the main things that your borrowers are borrowing for? Uh, yes, so key reasons for borrowing, um, as I said, car sales is one of our shareholders, so automotive finance is an important part of our business. Um, um, often people are actually have existing debts, they might have run up some debts running up to Christmas or have gone on a holiday, so it might be credit card consolidation, you know, you're paying 20% on your credit cards, if you're not paying that off every month it doesn't make sense to have those outstanding. So often people will refinance themselves into a personal loan gives them flexibility to make early repayments anyhow. Um, the, we do do a lot of home improvements, um, so kitchen refurbishments, those sorts of things. And then it's a really diverse um, tale after that for everything from holidays, weddings, investments, you know, you name it. Um, so it's a really diversified mix of purposes, not dissimilar to what any other traditional lending institution would have. We very much steer away from having an over, you know, specific concentration of a specific type of risk. Um, it's really about, you know, reflecting the population in terms of purposes, in terms of geographic distribution, age distribution. So if you know you see the metrics of our loan book, there's nothing sort of skewed or surprising there, and that's just good credit management. Mm. We have had some commercial partners in the past which have 
you know, for example, we used to fund Purple Bricks, which is a disruptive real estate agency. Yeah. We used to fund their fees. Um, when, when we're not doing that anymore. But again, that was around, you know, lending to homeowners. Um, renewable energy, again, sort of, you know, homeowners. So we, re we really are, if we're going to skew, um, have a disproportionate amount of funding in one particular area, we want to make sure that it's to um, a, a set of borrowers where we're confident that the credit risk is relatively benign. Do you have more investors or borrowers on the books at the moment? Well, it's an interesting question. I get asked that a lot, and my answer is ordinarily, um, by definition, we can't have more of one than the other because yeah. we've got market clearing <laughs> rates. Um, I think if I if I uh, walked you around our office and explained what most of the staff are doing, you know, ninety nine percent of the effort is going into attracting good credit quality borrowers and actually what we've found is that we've got a great product for investors people who start investing with us tend to enjoy the experience and just keep putting in more the typical investments now up to about twenty thousand dollars so um, it means we have never really had to focus too much on investors i think given our growth is sort of exponential and the amount of investor funds that are coming needing to come in to fund our borrower growth, um, now we've got the sort of foundations in place, we are now starting to think a bit more about the investors that we're attracting um, and we'll put more effort in that regard. But we've been very fortunate that actually um, there is a level of interest in what we're offering. People typically do understand that actually consumer credit is a good asset class um, and in a recession it typically performs well. Loss rates might double for a period of time but ordinarily they quickly um, resort to the rates that they were at and collections on the period where there were high loss rates typically clear out quite quickly. So if 99% of the team are chasing borrowers and you've got a lot of investor demand, do you worry that there will be a need to branch out into like worse and worse credit opportunities? No, not at all. I think it's really incumbent on the business to make sure that you are responsible around who you're lending to. Now that said, given the way we have risk adjusted pricing, you could go further down the credit spectrum and lend to um, riskier borrowers as long as you price for that risk. Um, I think as a business, we're very much focused on lending to that banking audience. And so um, we, we, we certainly um, <coughs> are growing though that audience sufficiently, you know, as I said, at about 100% a year to certainly not see any logic in changing the, the audience that we're lending to. Yeah. Um, and I think that would be concerning if that was sort of part of our strategy. And there's no appetite to go more alternative, you know, try and disrupt payday and do payday lending into really short term or to, to lend against, you know, stranger asset classes or anything like that? No, not at all. I think we're, we're very... Um, this is one of the benefits of, I guess, you know, our chairman is Vaughan Richter. He used to run I ING. Um, really took that from a new business in Australia to the fifth largest mortgage book and some other board representatives about just maintaining focus on the three borrower products we have, which is a personal loan, um, a renewable energy loan, and, and sort of an automotive loan would describe separately. And it's really about getting scale in each of those areas. It's not about, you know, with the, the demand we've got going further down the credit yeah, spectrum. Yeah. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit in terms of just you know, having better credit data and actually approving people that, you know, you should be approving, but we might be declining now because we don't have enough information to get comfortable. So we certainly know our approval rates are much lower than similar businesses in the US and the UK, but they have the benefit of better data. So we're moving into, and it, you know, it's not ideal if you're declining someone for a loan when actually they should be getting a loan and they are a good credit characteristic. But the unfortunate thing is, and a lot of your audience will appreciate this, in Australia, the credit bureaus don't get information relating to your you know good credit behavior and that might be you know you paying your telco bill on time your utility bills on time and so and a lot of people now don't go and get a credit card like the prior generation might have got bought their home earlier and they got a credit card with their mortgage and so they had a credit profile really early on that they could sort of leverage now we often find people are a little bit you know in their t into their 20s without a credit tr history and it's quite hard for them to get finance and so you know, you don't really want to be declining people who are not a low, who are a low credit risk, but they just don't have that credit profile. So, we do have instances where we might lend a lend a lower amount for a shorter period of time to someone without the same strength of credit record. But actually, we've found 
the audience we're lending to that fit that credit credit category um, are you know, performing really well. Um, one more criticism that I want to give you a chance to respond to. Um, so there's a lot of people out there that will say, you know, marketplace lenders have come in and basically taken what banks do traditionally and put it online, uh, and there's a lot of cost of overhead there, so they can offer uh, better rates to borrowers and um, better rates to investors, um, but it's not a sustainable uh, a cost advantage. Um, banks will have a lower cost of capital and they will be able to reduce what they charge borrowers if peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer lending gets big enough. So when you look forward and you think about, you know, CBA and Westpac turning their sights on you and the industry, how do you how do you think about that criticism and how do you think about the future? Yeah, uh, it's a very interesting question. I think we're finding the opposite at the moment, as particularly with the Royal Commission and, and to the banks that actually they're withdrawing from consumer credit in some areas. I think they find it quite hard to service customers the way they need to to comply with the responsible lending obligations. We've seen one of the big four move out of personal lending altogether and out of the broker channel, which is an important channel for us. So um, so I think that's one, one point. I think another point is where we're lending is often in areas where it would be impossible for a bank to really provide the service. And I talk about the South Australia program where we're lending to households where you know, we get an invoice in relation to the installation of a solar panels and a battery. We need to match that against the Clean Energy Finance um, Council's criteria. Um, there's different processes of engaging with the, you know, the manufacturer of the product and the installer, um, and we build technology integrations to some of those companies. These are the sorts of things that actually banks can't really do. So we, um, we're not always competing against banks. We might be competing against banks if we're attracting someone from Google or otherwise, um, but actually in a lot of, increasingly in, in the parts of our business, we're, you know, we're, you know, our main borrower channels are not really head to head with the big four banks, for example. Um, so I think that, that, that means that actually they can't just turn around and compete with us when it's sort of impossible for them to do that. Um, I think um, around rates and whether they just wanted to hugely reduce their rates and be more competitive in that regard, I think that's there's always a risk to an extent. And we've seen some more digital orientated banks offer attractive rates at different times. They generally find it's not sustainable. They do have relatively significant cost bases, and um, I think. Um, the, if anything, at the moment we're seeing them under pressure in terms of um, their cost base and their their spreads are not really reducing. Um, if anything, I think that you know they'd like to be going in the other direction. Yeah. Um, so I think if we see interest rates go up um, over coming years, we're likely to see just that spread. You know, both the the investor rate and the or the deposit rate and the borrowing rates move up in tandem mm -hmm. um, through the banking system. And we expect the same with our markets. We expect our investor return requirements to go up and our borrow rates will go up accordingly. There's such a significant advantage at the moment in terms of the investor return versus the deposit in our model that actually I think um, there's, um, to say that another way, um, our five-year market rate at the moment is, is about 9.5%, as I said, and it's in the UK for rates of this business, it's typically lower than 6%. So I think as people get more comfortable with us, as we build more of a track record, that return requirement, if you call it, will continue to track down, which means we continue to be able to offer our borrowers a better and better product. Mm. Um, so, so you don't worry that as there's more competition in the peer-to-peer -peer space, um, the cost of capital to attract investors to your platform will actually trend up? No, no, I don't think so. I think once one has a bigger provision fund and you're making it a safer and safer investment for people, it should track down. And financial services is all, is all about trust and track record. And as we build that trust, build that track record, in part through just being really transparent, you know, we release our loan book every three months, for example, so people can really understand who we're lending to. Um, we expect those rates to track down, not up. Yeah. Um, and around competition, um, I mean, it's interesting, there's not actually that many consumer uh, marketplace lending businesses or peer-to-peer -peer lending businesses in Australia. Um, it's, you know, the, the, there are different balance sheet type lending models. Um, and we, perversely, we actually quite like the idea of a, 
relatively mild recession in, in Australia because it gives us an opportunity to prove up our credit performance. Um, we'll likely see some other um, lenders who might be quite aggressive at different stages probably step back. And I think that really creates opportunities for a business like us. Um, and look, we're also going through a process at the moment of, um, uh, or just completing um, a process to raise capital to really move more into the right mainstream during the course of next year, um, particularly as we move into open banking and it's much easier for people to share information with us, get a faster loan approval, get better rates, those sorts of things. We'll build more of a brand presence in Australia. Um, and I think you know, it's about becoming just a, an ordinary, you know, um, part of the the furniture yeah, and, yeah. And, and, um, and having that ongoing awareness will mean that you're a more sustainable, stable business. Yeah. So, Dan, we always finish our interviews with three questions. Um, I've been warned. <laughs> yeah, good, good. You've had time to prep. Um, they don't have to be directly r- relative to or related to equities. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the first one is, where do you go for your investing information? Uh, I, I subscribe to the Financial Times. I read the UK and the Asian versions. Um, and so I really like having that international perspective. I also read the AFR every day. Um, but I like to lean more on sort of just making sure I'm informed internationally. I have to confess, I don't have any equities investments. Really? No. I, I have in the past... But actually, I think I would prefer to invest in businesses I'm involved in in some capacity um, or where I've got relationships where I know people who are providing, you know, for example, I invest in some property um, property investments in New Zealand, funnily enough, um, my native country, yeah. um, only because I know people there and I believe I can um, um, make a better return in a lower risk way than... Than, than what I might from equities. And similarly, I've got an SMSF which is entirely invested on my uh, the five-year market and, and rate setter. <laughs> yeah, I'm not telling, I'm not suggesting your audience all go out and do that um, <laughs> with 100% of their funds. I do believe in diversification, but my experience with equities was that I was very much getting a market return and, but, you know, real periods of volatility. Mm. And um, I just thought with my understanding of certain industries that I've operated and once you start working in them you end up with a bit of a competitive advantage so I've invested in other sort of disruptive financial services businesses for example Fair enough. Um, so but you know you never really know what those returns are until you've sold so yeah, you can well, come, and come and speak in five years time and have a view on those things uh, so what are some must read books investing or otherwise I have to confess I'm not a, a, a huge reader of business books okay. um, I tend to, I just don't find them interesting enough. Um, that said, I do read different economist um, columns on a regular basis. Um, there are, you know, people like, not that I would necessarily agree with them, but I, you know, I like to read Larry Summers' views on the world. But in terms of books, the last book I read was The Churchill Factor by Boris Johnson. And I thought it was brilliant. And actually, like most of these things, there is a business overlay to everything when you read about a leader like that. And um, um, so I would highly recommend that to anyone who hasn't read it. Nice. We'll put that on the website for our listeners. Um, Final one before Ren comes in with his (laughs) his special. What would you tell your 20-year-old self? I think to follow your instinct. Yeah, I think um, I go back to, I mentioned when I was working at Rothschild, I always had a a sense that I would be doing something more entrepreneurial over time, ideally starting my own business. I guess you don't have the confidence that time to know exactly what it is and where it's going to go. And um, I could have stayed in banking for a long time. I could have stayed in Europe for a long time. Um, and it would have been a comfortable existence, although probably still working ridiculous hours. Um, but my instinct was to to do something different, and um, and I am glad I followed it. And I suspect if I hadn't, I would be quite frustrated. Mm. Um, and you, one might say that I'd spent just a couple of years too long without following my instinct. Good advice. Yeah. <laughs> Quit and commit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, final question, you know, we're equity mates, we mainly talk about investing in equity markets, 
you've got our listeners' attention. Um, what What's the pitch to take some money that you were going to invest in equity markets and instead invest it in you know rate setter or similar peer to peer platforms? Um, look, I'm I'm clearly a little bit biased, but I would say it's a no brainer part of one's portfolio. I think um, Australians do not have enough exposure to fixed ex, fixed income investments. There is a you know a heavy bias relative to other markets towards obviously property and equities um, and and term deposits. You know if you want to maximise your return, you look at CAPM theory. Diversification is important when you can diversify diversify into a very well established asset class, earning you know up to nine and a half percent consumer loans. I think that's a very compelling reason to to diversify your portfolio. You should reduce the volatility and arguably increase the the long term return on your portfolio, which makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and I think that that's a general direction that this country will go in over the next five or ten years. There'll be more exposure to fixed income investments, and consumer credit is just a really large asset pool that where people should have more exposure. Rather than investing in bank equities and bank term deposits, one can go direct and get a better long run return as a consequence of actually getting direct access rather than wearing that cost base and spread. Well, and don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not just here to beat up the banks because we, we, <laughs> we, we collaborate with banks and funnily enough we actually have banks lending on our platform. Oh, so wow. yeah, um, and to renewable energy in particular. So. Um, it's really not a beat up on banks. We all need banks. I, you know, um, use a bank like most people. Um, but I think that there are compelling alternatives out there, and I think peer-to-peer -peer lending makes a lot of sense. One can go to our website, uh, ratesetter.com.au, and it's quickly. You one can get up the curve really quickly. And as we sort of talked about, the typical journey is investing a relatively small amount of money, understanding it, getting comfortable with it, and you can, one can take it from there. Well, Dan, you've been the first person I think we've interviewed in the last 18 months that hasn't had a direct in influence or uh, contact with equities. Um, but as we said off air, this is a show that we try and expose our listeners to as many sort of avenues of investing as possible. So you've certainly given us a great introduction into peer-to-peer -peer lending and into rate setter and appreciate you coming on the show with us. Um, I've certainly learned a fair bit um, and that there are some options other than your 1% term deposit out there at the moment. Uh, so again, thanks for your time and appreciate you coming on. Thank you, gentlemen, much appreciated. Equity mates and the people appearing in this program may have positions in the companies mentioned. This is general advice only. Please speak to a financial professional to understand how it may pertain to your individual situation.